for single subject design and model fitting. My name is Dr. Sean Gillen, um, Assistant Professor of Psychology at Louisiana State University, and I'm honored to introduce our speakers for today's tutorial. So we have Dr. DeHart and Frida. Dr. DeHart completed his training at Utah State and is currently a postdoctoral fellow at the Fraley Biomedical Research Institute at the Virginia Tech Caribbean School of Medicine. Dr. Frida also completed his training at Utah State and is currently a research scientist at the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health. Both of these uh, speakers have expertise in various areas of applied behavioral economics, and their tutorial today focuses on how multi-level modeling can, apply, can be applied in single subject designs and behavioral economic studies. So a very broad applicability to a wide range of behavior analytic designs. Personally, multi-level modeling is quickly become my preferred analytic tool in behavior analysis because this approach does preserve the individual in these group level comparisons and inferences. For a very long time, it was a large sticking point for behavior analysis. The authors apply these methods today using the free and open source R statistical program, uh, which is another uh, great advance that supports replicability. Um, and that's it. That's the book. Good morning. Uh, I sort of realized as as we got closer to the time for me to give this talk, my horror has been growing because, to a certain extent, this is at least a single graduate level course and we're going to cover it all in about 45 minutes. So, uh, hold on your hands. Uh, so, why are we interested in multi level modeling? I think one of the things that we've always been focused on in behavior analysis is to focus on individual subject data. And we're sort of worried about what happens when you aggregate that. So, you move from you know, looking at zebras to what ends up being a donkey. Um, and with multi-level modeling, you can look at all of the data from a single subject and compare it to itself, and you can look at all of the data from a subject and compare it to all of the data from another subject. And so you don't necessarily have to, to lose any of that, that single subject data. We've always been so classically interested. So from a statistical perspective, one of the goals is to sort of control uh, the noise that's introduced from a single subject. And really what we're just trying to do is separate out what are the effects caused by our independent variables and what are the effects that are really sort of caused just by single subject differences within some, or across subject differences. So as we go through today, we're gonna to build sort of from simple linear regression to more complica complicated multi-level models. Um, because at the core, uh, multi-level models are really just complex linear regressions that are built on simpler linear regressions. Uh, so as we're talking about linear regression, this is really everything you would have been taught, or part of what you would have been taught in an uh, introductory statistics course. We're talking about fitting a straight line to some data. Uh, so you have the classic straight line, and now we have a simple regression line. Uh, and so you just change your parameters up a little bit. Um, I'm going to use the, that bottom equation a lot. Uh, y equals A for your intercept, plus beta x, uh, and then plus your error. Um, your error again is just sort of trying to capture the fact that your line doesn't perfectly match your data, right? There's some measurement error, there might be some, uh, some error, just residuals in your data. Uh, and also, I'm going to use the A parameter for your intercept just so that there's clarity. A lot of times if you look through the literature, if you're looking online for help, uh, the intercept parameter will be referred to as beta zero, or uh, beta sub zero, um, so just keep that in mind. Uh, so we want a concrete example, because uh, it's really hard to describe how this process works if we just say y equals x, y equals x over and over and over again. Uh, so imagine we're going to do an instant survey in this room because I have that power, and we're interested in how everybody enjoys Chicago, because uh, everybody always seems to be excited here, there's a lot to do uh, when you're not at a conference. But we're going to, our independent variable is going to be how much time you spend in traffic which is pretty atrocious here, right? So we're going to look at your enjoyment scores as a function of time and traffic, and surprising no one, it drastically decreases the more time you're in traffic. So if you want to do a simple linear regression with that, you really just have to take that simple line and fit it to your data, and you get an intercept and a slope parameter, and plot that on your figure, and you're pretty much done. 
right? So every minute that you sit in traffic, your enjoyment of Chicago decreases. Um, but what if we had people who are from Washington, D.C., we're just going to look at them as a specific group because Washington, D.C. has worse traffic than Chicago, uh, the internet tells me anyways. Um, so now we're looking at two groups of people, right? This is sort of a common approach that, some, a common question that people might have in psychology. Uh, and so now we're talking about multiple regression, right? You may or may not cover this in your introductory statistics class, it might be in the regression class. Um, but it's still really a very simple regression line. You're just adding an extra beta parameter and an extra independent variable for your group. So in this case, that would be beta 2 and your g for group. Uh, and because it's a categorical variable, you have to code it in some way. Uh, so let's say uh, everybody else, the rest of us are group 0, and the um, people from Washington are going to be group 1. So when you fit that line, you now get an intercept parameter and two beta parameters. And there would be the line of the best fit. So what we're saying is every minute you sit in traffic, your, uh, the, your enjoyment of Chicago decreases, and uh, people from, who are from Washington happen to be a little bit happier here because the traffic's not as bad. Uh, and what, what we're really saying with that extra beta parameter is, being from Chicago just bumps up how much you like Chicago by one and a half units. And this is sort of a common approach. This is what multiple regression is. Uh, this is what we typically do in psychology with, with these sort of regressions. But as we move towards multi-level models, it's sort of important to appreciate what these parameters are actually trying to capture and what they mean. Um, so in a typical regression, in this typical simple linear regression, the beta coefficient is really supposed to be an estimate of the population parameter. Right, so what we're saying is that everybody from Washington, no matter who you picked, would be happier in Chicago by 1.5 units than everybody else in the country, which doesn't really make sense. Um, but from a practical standpoint, that's what this regression equation says. And so these are typically referred to as fixed effects because the, the parameter is fixed within the population. Uh, oh, there we go. Um, so, one of the critical assumptions about multi-level modeling is that there is a variability in that parameter. It is not necessarily the case that everybody from Washington has the same 1.5 unit increase in happiness or enjoyment. Uh, and so those parameters aren't fixed for the whole population. It really depends on, on what your case, how you group the data. Uh, and so what we're really saying is those, those, the beta parameters we're talking about in multi-level modeling are drawn for, from some unknown distribution. Um, in each case of your data, each cluster, however you want to call that, has a, a different value. And so these are typically referred to as random effects because they are randomly distributed uh, based on, on some uh, distribution. Uh, so I'm going to refer to these as beta hat, which isn't totally appropriate. Uh, beta hat is usually used to refer to something else. But I think it keeps it clean on, it's still the same sort of beta parameter, but we're talking about a, a random effect here. So whenever you see that hat, you'll know we're talking about a, a random effect. So as I mentioned, the thing we're, we're really interested in is what is the case of your data? How, how are your data clustered together? Uh, and that's really where multi-level modeling gets interesting, which is why we, we should care. Um, the cases are really however you define it, or probably better, how your data define itself. Uh, you could have each data have a random effect, but I think that would be kind of crazy, and I don't know that anybody actually does that. Uh, for us, your, the data from a single subject, that subject is going to be a case. Uh, you could have different groups of people or different groups of subjects or participants being uh, their own case of data, so that data should hold together. And when you get to the multi-level portion of it, now you have a single subject being a case, but that single subject is nested at a higher level than it's another group, right? So we're building multi level data, right? Um, so the whole point is if your data is complex and your, your phenomenon is complex, you're trying to use multi-level modeling to capture some of that complexity. So if you take a step back just so we're all on the same page, remember when we're talking about fixed effects, what we're trying to say is that the effect of an independent variable on your dependent variable is the same for the entire data set or the entire population. Uh, if we're talking about a random effect, 
we're saying the effect of the independent variable on the dependent variable is different for each data, probably most appropriately, but for each case of your data. And again, it's not necessarily that it's random and we don't know why something's happening. We're just saying we don't know why there's a degree of variability here, but there is. And when we get to multi-level modeling, what we really want to focus on is the effect of the independent variable and the dependent variable is different for each case of your data. And uh, that case level effect depends on some other variable nested at a higher level. Right? So we have repeated metrics from subjects that are existing in some group. Right? So we have a group level effect, and then we also have a subject level effect. Uh, those are uh, I think that I always thought the, the rat growth curve is sort of a great example that we should, most of us should be somewhat familiar with as an example of a multi-level model. Uh, the, a rat's weight is dependent on the individual subject, their initial weight when they're born, but it's also dependent on what their sex is, right? So those two data paths diverge. But the individual level is nested at, in, within the sex. Uh, so if we go back to our example of looking at people in traffic, we could we could describe that data without a multiple regression. We could use a multi-level model, uh, and these models look familiar. Uh, you really just have to say, look, our intercept parameter here is going to be a random effect. It's going to be we're going to be nesting, uh, and so what does it look like when you fit that model? Um, you get a beta parameter, right? It's, we have a fixed beta parameter. It's the same for, the pop, for, the, for both of those groups. Uh, and the important thing, when you do a lot of these fitting uh, algorithms, I mean, the, the, the statistical output will generally just straight up way give you uh, the mean and the standard deviation from your parameters. Uh, so if we plot the mean uh, intercept, then we get the standard deviation of the intercept. That's what our multi-level model is saying about our data. Um, every minute that you're in traffic, your enjoyment of Chicago goes down by one unit, and there's an average intercept of about 6.65, which is actually worse than what we had before. Right? At least before, we could say, well, there's, you're bumping your score up by 1.5 units, and now we've just said, well, there's some unknown variability there. Uh, so if that was what, where you stop with MLMs, I would say run for the hills. Um, but remember, how this works is you actually do have a random effect for each case of your data. Uh, and so it's not just a parameter that has some randomness, you're, you're building complex linear regressions from simpler linear regressions. Uh, and so we actually have a regression equation that describes how each group intercept deviates from the mean intercept. Right? And the parameters look different because now we're talking about gamma values, but it's that it's a simple regression, right? You have an alpha parameter, a beta x, and an error term. So if we go back to our model results, we don't really have an a hat parameter. We had a second regression parameter hiding sort of in plain sight. And using that second regression equation, we can sort of solve for what our actual uh, intercepts are for each group, right? So if we figure out the, by plotting those. By cutting those intercepts, then we can plot the specific paths for each group, right? And that actually is a better description of our data than just leaving error across there. Right, so now we can say um, every minute that you're in traffic, your enjoyment of Chicago decreases by one. And the real difference between the groups is that when modular people get here, they're a little bit happier because traffic's not as bad, but just like the rest of us, they hate how, how crappy it is here, right? And they, their enjoyment drops off just as fast as everyone else, right? So it is a slightly different story that might make a little bit more sense uh, from a practical standpoint. So the other important detail is random slopes. Um, so let's say we have a group of people who took the train in to Chicago in general or just took the train in from uh, the airport and I'm told that the train faster. I don't know, I don't take the train. Um, but we do apparently have a group that uh, their enjoyment of Chicago is not falling off as quickly. So that appears to be a difference in slope between those groups. Uh, if you're doing this in multiple regression, you have to have some interaction term to sort of capture that effect. Uh, but with a multi-level model, we just say, look, it looks like the slopes are different for these groups. So we can fit that model. We get, again, a mean uh, and the standard deviation for our slope parameters. 
uh, that's the plotted line. I'm not going to show the error bars because, again, remember, we're just talking about uh, hiding a regression equation that describes deviations from the mean slope for each group. And we can, we can solve for the specific group level slopes and now just plot those lines. Uh, and so it appears that the enjoyment of Chicago decreases less rapidly if you take the train because maybe you avoid a little bit more traffic than everybody else. So those are just specific, what about, you know, one slope, one group. The real complexity comes in as you start getting more, more levels and more, uh, more, you know, slopes and intercepts being different for each group, right? So if we have three groups, if people are from Washington, people are from New York, and then the rest of us, right? Um, we have also individual ratings for each group, and this is like my favorite figure ever because my legend is roughly the same size as the plot. Um, and so if we do just a quick visual analysis, it looks like most people are giving lower ratings as time passes, and there does seem to be a, a cluster of low ratings for all the time points. Sadly, we get rid of the legend because we don't really need it, but I love it. Uh, with multi-level models, again, remember that if the regression equations at the higher level are being applied to the lower levels, or you could say that the, you have a scaffold and these simpler low-level regressions that are being used to hold up a, a complex multi-level model you know, as a gross oversimplification. Uh, but we have, remember, for this data, we have data that's <coughs> clustered by individuals that exist within groups. So we need a regression for all the data, we need a regression for uh, how the groups deviate from the whole sample, and we need a regression for how the subjects are deviating for each group. Uh, and again, we're just building from simpler to more complex. So if our final equation is, looks relatively simple because we just have, oh look, it's a random uh, intercept by group and we have a random slope by group, uh, if, we're, if those lower level regressions are sort of hiding in plain sight, you could also express our regression equation uh, as just the extra pieces, those lower level regression equations uh, in the number theory. And I'm not going to show the lower, the lower level regression equation for the subject level data because there's not really enough space on the screen. And the, the steps are really the same. You're replacing each of those gamma parameters with the subject level effects. Um, and I think it's important to note we really should be doing this for all time series data, all single subject data. You really need to account for the fact that the data our subject is clustered together no matter how you do it. Um, so we get our mean slope and we get our mean intercept and we plot that. My animations are not working that set. Um, so let's just say that that heavy black line through the middle, that's the mean uh, intercept that we have, uh, sorry, the mean uh, line that we have that doesn't really fit any of our data. But remember, as we plot each of these out, uh, we can see that that red line um, those are people from Washington, so they start off being really happy that traffic here is better than in Washington, but you could say that quickly drops off. Uh, the rest of us in this case are actually just pretty happy to be in Chicago because it's a nice time. Uh, and we could say the bottom people, uh, those are the New Yorkers who apparently, if you're from New York, everywhere else is just not as good. <laughs> so you're never happy. Um, and then for the sake of demonstration, I did add a single subject level fix, right? And you can actually sort of see the data paths for the individual subject level data mapping on pretty well to what those group level fits are doing. Right, so that's really all we're trying to do is build the scaffolding at the multiple levels for a single regression equation that's sort of holding everything together. So that is your probably three or four graduate level courses in multi-level modeling. I'm gonna give it a break. Yeah, thank you, John. So, so John did an outstanding job kind of setting the stage of what a multi-level model is, what does it represent. And so now I'm going to take some time and specifically talk about how these could be applied to single subject design data. So imagine you have this great single subject design data. You have an ABAB design here. There's some very clear, you know, visually you can see some differences between baseline and treatment. But, you know, you go to the rest of your psych department, you're really excited about it, or you try to publish somewhere in a more general psychology journal and you get this feedback. What about the p-value? Is it statistically significant? And so you may think back to um, the stats training you maybe had and you think, well, you know, t-tests are great, right? And if your hammer is big enough, everything looks like a nail. t-test is very robust. It's very um, easily interpreted and implemented. And so maybe you do something like this where you run a t-test between your baseline and your 
treatment conditions. Or you do something like you fit a regression line to those different conditions, and then you run a t-test on your beta values, which logically doesn't really work because if you remember inferential statistics, what the assumption is is that your, your mean is pulled from a population of means that represent human behavior. And so this is saying that your beta, your mean of betas are pulled from a population of betas. And so there's, you know, there's several steps of, of disconnect there that, that aren't really working. And so kind of going back to, to something that, that John taught, um, you know, these, these linear regressions are introduced in either like the first statistics course or, or the second. And again, the goal of these linear regressions is to fit a, a line in a way that minimizes the residuals, that minimizes the spacing between your points on the line on both sides of the line. And there are some very important assumptions of like a, a simple linear or multiple regression. That first assumption is something that John touched on, and that's the independence of observations. Now, single subject design, that's immediately, um, immediately um, violated. Right, so because data are clustered within a subject, in the case of single subject design, um, those data points are correlated. And so just right off the bat, a, a multiple regression or, or um, like a, a t-test is, is probably inappropriate. The other two, homogeneity and variance and normality of residuals is, is something I'll, I'll touch on with a little bit more information. So the first one, homogeneity of variance, assumes that those residuals along that line, the, the distribution of them is, is fairly uniform across the entire regression line. So if you see the left graph there, if you fit a line through that, those residuals on the bottom of the graph are going to be more or less the same as the residuals on the top. Now, because of the degree of variability in individual behavior, which we value as behavior analysts, we typically will see something that's, that's more referred to as heteroscedasticity which means that the residuals around that regression line can change, will, will be, are not uniform. And so what that, what that leads to is this violation of the assumption of normality of, of residuals. And in single subject design data, because we don't typically rely on truly continuous variables, we, we use things like counts, Oftentimes, we do violate that assumption of normality of residuals, where you can see in, 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 like a, a, in a preparation that is count data, we're very heavily weighted on the, the lower amounts and very few data points up higher. And then finally, and, that, and again, I think that the, the largest issue that we have with um, more traditional statistical methods is, again, where's the behavior? What when we, you know, John gave a great example of the average zebra is a donkey, right? You've condensed all of your important variability down into some group means and you've, you've lost that, that very valuable information. So going back to my original example, you may end up with something like this, where you've got your means for each condition, but you've lost a lot of that important variability there. So, as we get into how to apply these to single subject design, there are a few important questions you have to ask yourself. The first is, what does your dependent variable look like? What's going to be your, your distribution of your dependent variable or, or the, the residuals? Now, there are generalized versions of multi-level modeling, which I, I will touch on. So, is it something like this that is a, a nice normal distribution? So, maybe if it's like a ratio of behavior that you might um, approximate more of a normal distribution, or again, those, those counts are, are likely not to be normal. You're looking at what um, statisticians refer to as either like a Poisson or a negative binomial distribution. And then, uh, perhaps most importantly for, for this audience, how many clusters or cases or highest level of organization do you have? And in single subject design, this would be how many subjects do you have? Very conservative estimates would suggest that you probably need 15 to 20 subjects in order to, to be confident in the results of a multi-level model. And I recognize that that's maybe more than, than many of you are accustomed to including in a single subject design experiment. And so I, I, I present that as, a, as just a um, kind of throw that out there that if you want to implement these methods, you do have to maybe reconsider a little bit of, of, of what you're doing. 
And then also how many data points do you have per cluster? That's probably something we don't have a problem with, right? So if you have 15 to 20 clusters or subjects and 15 data points, you're, you're right in the sweet spot there. And so that's something that I think we're probably good on. And then the other one is how many predictor variables, such as session or group, do you have? Like any statistic, as you increase the number of covariates or predictor variables, you also increase the, the, the required sample size to, to properly fit your model. So I'm going to go through a few examples. This first one is, is an animal model looking at the effects of nicotine on resurgence of alcohol self-administration. So we have 15 experimentally naive rats, and this study came from um, a colleague of mine, Casey Fry. And so you have, we have these three groups. We have the saline group, the nicotine group, and then a nicotine plus MLOI, which is an antidepressant group. And we're interested in alcohol consumption um, within these three groups. And so they get 10 sessions of baseline, and then five sessions of either a saline injection, a nicotine injection, or an injection of nicotine plus an MAOI. And this is our, our group level data. And visually, you can, you, know, you can make a really nice case for, well, the nicotine group, there looks to be an increase in um, alcohol consumption in the MAOI group. There's a decrease, and our saline group is, is nice and, and level. And if we were to just stop there, or maybe run a t-test, between those two conditions, um, you may get what you want, but again, as, I, as I've discussed, that t-test is just not appropriate for this type of data. And so we fit our multi-level model, and we get those nice fixed effects that are interpreted like any regression. But we also get those very valuable random effects, which help us understand the degree of variability within both our, our subject and within those groups. And so you look at, you end up with something like this, where you do have your group fits, but you also have an idea of the individual variability. Um, and so you kind of have the best of both worlds. So in this example, this because um, alcohol consumption was ultimately reported as a ratio, you were able to use just a simple linear multi-level model. Uh, but what happens when that's not appropriate? What happens when your outcome is a count, for example? So I'd like to just make a shameless plug for a recently published paper by myself and, and a colleague of mine, Brent Kaplan, where we applied mixed effects or multi-level modeling to um, uh, some single subject design data using a generalized multi-level model. So these data were extracted from Ackerland Brand, and typical, typical functioning children were given three conditions as to choose the, the reinforcer received for, for completing a trial. One was a control, which was just like a verbal good job. The second one was an experimenter chosen reinforcer. And the third one was a child chosen. So they got to choose the reinforcer they got. And the, um, the researchers wanted to understand, or wanted to, to investigate what reinforcer the child was most likely to choose. So anyway, um, they reported 15 participants um, graphically. And so um, we took that data. And it's important to point out that there's a, a variable number of sessions here, which is another important power of multi-level modeling, is with an ANOVA, you may, you may remember that your cells have to be equal. You have to have the same number of participants in your cells. Uh, um, same thing with like a t-test, so you, you have to have you know, similar data points. And multi-level model, you don't necessarily have to do that. So this is what our individual subject data looks like. You'll notice that, that visually, that the child condition is, is overall more likely to be selected across trials. Although there's some interesting things to point out. One is that the control condition for a lot of children was just never selected. It's zero. And so we have what we call zero inflation, which is also something that is difficult to address using just a, a typical multi, multiple regression. The other thing to point out is that the, the rate of, of selecting the child reinforcer um, is maybe not linear, right? So it's not a, a straight line, it, it appears what could be logarithmic. And so when you look at that data, you realize that we can't use a linear model to address that. So here we used a generalized linear model where uh, a link function is used to transform your model. And again, we get these, these very nice uh, fixed effects 
that describe um, group differences or condition differences. But we also get these very valuable random effects. And like any regression analysis, we do have your, your typical regression diagnostics. And the ones to, to kind of point out here is because we use this generalized linear model, that the histogram of residuals looks fairly uniform, and so does our Q2 plot, meaning that there's no kind of systematic deviation in residuals. Um, if we would have just tried a simple uh, a, a linear multi-level model, like I, I used in experiment one, that would not look nearly that pretty, which means that your model doesn't accurately reflect your data. But here's the really important, here's the very valuable thing that these random effects give us, is that the individual or at the subject or at our, at our cluster level, we can also predict behavior. So, as I pointed out at the beginning, several of these participants did not receive the entire 13-session treatment. So if you wanted to take someone like Hank, or maybe um, Jonah, and say, okay, they only did eight sessions, where would we expect them to be at 13 compared to Lamar, who did complete all 13 sessions? And so because we have those random effects at the individual level, we can predict individual behavior. So now I'm going to turn the time over to, to John again, who's going to talk about a, a more advanced application of multi-level modeling. All right. Um, so we had to cut this section down a little bit. Um, as I, was, I, I wrote the first section of the presentation first, and it was about 50 slides, and I realized that's not going to do. Uh, and so we decided to, to trim the section down a little bit. Um, for, for a couple of reasons that I'll get into. But when, we're, when you're doing a multi-level model, um, for a theoretical model that's not linear, um, the steps that you use are actually functionally the same that you use for a linear model. You're just specifying, hey, instead of a simple linear regression, I want you to look at uh, my theoretical model. Um, and I think, again, it's important to note the, the beauty of doing this is you can fit a model to the group level data, and you can fit a model to the individual subject level data at the same time. And you can use those fits to inform each other. Uh, so typically what we do is we fit the mean, you know, a model to a mean data set, and then we fit the model to the individual subjects, and we start comparing uh, parameters from those individual subject fits. Uh, but with the multi-level modeling, you do it all at once, and you potentially have a better representation of, of those parameter estimates for, for your individual subjects. Um, I point to uh, Young 2017. There we go. Uh, as a great example of how to do multi-level modeling uh, for delay discounting using indifference points. Um, Kirk, Patrick, Marshall, Steele, and Peterson have another great article um, on how to do this with it's discounting, but it's the monetary choice questionnaire, so it's a slightly different task. Um, and I really point you to, to to those two great articles. They're very exhaustive. They cover. Uh, I thought more than I actually thought I needed to know, um, so they're, they're excellent. And so why, one of the reasons we decided to trim space in this, this area a little bit uh, is that when you get into nonlinear modeling, I found it actually is a little bit more complicated um, than I thought it was going to be. So I'm really focusing on the conceptual details and sort of the basic mechanics of how you, you go about doing this. Um, and because there's, there's extra layers of complexity when you get to nonlinear models, um, and it's not that this process is hard, it just requires extra work. Um, so for example, one of the things that I, I ran into is that a lot of the fitting algorithms don't allow you to limit parameters, which normally isn't a problem, but you know, for example, in discounting, K is bound to be a positive value, right? That's what makes the curve go down instead of the curve going up, which doesn't happen. Um, and in a lot of these fitting algorithms, you can't do that, and if you go looking for help as to why, uh, the statisticians who are at a much higher pay level than me say, why would you want to do that? They're, they're not typically interested in these sorts of questions that we are interested in where a, a parameter actually means something and has a specific range of values. And so you have to, you have to do certain things like transform your parameters or take some extra steps. So again, it's not hard, it's just there's extra work that you're going to um, so I wanted to provide, because the, there's two great examples of doing multi-level modeling for uh, discounting, I just wanted to provide an example using demand curves. Um, so this is a data set that we have, uh, 
I had access to where we were looking at the likelihood of people replying to a text message uh, while they were driving. Uh, and there were two groups of people, those people who were just in general more likely to use their cell phone while driving, and people who were less likely to use their cell phone while driving, which includes um, you know, looking at you know, Instagram or using Google Maps or something like that. Um, so here, the model that we fit to these data are the exponentiated demand model, because uh, we had a lot of zero values, because it was a likelihood measure. Um, and it, it sort of looks like those individual fits don't fit the mean data all that well. Um, that, that the lower line is people who should be people who are less likely to use their cell phone. Uh, but the, the people who are very likely to use their cell phone, that actually looks like a pretty good fit. And so it, you kind of question, well, why would you do this multi-level model that actually doesn't do that good of a job? And I think, again, it's important you want to, when you're, when you're doing this, you need to be looking at more, you gotta, you gotta do the work to sort of make sure everything is, is doing what it should be doing in the multi-level fit. Uh, so if we add in the sort of individual subject line, you can see two of the people who are unlikely cell phone users. We've added a, a likely cell phone user, and I'm just gonna dump everybody up there all at once. Um, and if you look at the individual fits for the highly likely cell phone users, there is a cluster of people that, individual fits that appear around that mean line that now is kind of hidden. Um, and there is a cluster of unlikely cell phone users that are around that mean line as well, right? So it, it does actually appear that those group level fits are, uh, are a good representation of our data. The important thing, I think, is when you look at it, there's actually, it doesn't look very purple on this screen, but there's a, there's a bold purple line creeping across the bottom of the figure, right? Those are people who functionally say, under no circumstances will I text while I'm driving. I won't do it. Right? And that's an important population to capture. Uh, when, you, when you add those people to your mean values, it just drags the mean down. Right? So it might actually be the case that the mean isn't necessarily the best representation of your data. Uh, and so we really have maybe three secret groups. We have our likely users, our unlikely users, and the people who are likely but actually just won't text. Right? So you can get results that are seemingly different from the typical fitting that you might be doing uh, but again, there's there's valuable information when you're, when you're doing these multi-level fits. Oh, I was supposed to have that up, sorry. Um, so the next part is sort of how you go through this and how you do this in the R. Um, yeah, right. yeah, so so every all the analyses and figures that we showed today were, were made in R, the R statistical environment, and I'd like to just take just a few minutes to talk a little bit about R. R is free which is very important. <laughs> it's script-based, which is also valuable because that, that is a, a great way to maintain data and analysis integrity, right? So instead of manipulating things in Excel, losing track of what you've done, the great thing about R is you put your raw data in, and then every step, every data cleaning step, every analysis is done in R. So theoretically, you could send someone your raw data and your R script, and they could you know, 100% replicate your analyses and results. And then again, oh, also, R is comprehensive, especially in, in behavior analysis, what we would want to do. There's really nothing that you couldn't do in R. Now, if you want to, like, analyze EEG data, there's some limitations in R, but for the most part, nearly all psychological statistics can be accomplished in R. And then again, I can't emphasize this enough, R is free, and, you know, the other packages are, are so, so expensive. And then I, I, I want to just, after I talk about the model a little bit, I want to just make a quick plug for, for Tidyverse when it comes to data cleaning. So this is the MLM example from, or experiment one from the RAD experiment. And you can see, that part. Um, so bef before the parentheses, that's just like your typical multiple regression. Right? Those are your fixed effects. But then, starting with the parenthesis, you see the, um, we have a, a random intercept as well as random slopes for condition and session. And all of that is clustered within our subject level. Right? So this is, this is really straightforward <coughs> syntax. And even John's kind of more complicated demand um, model, I know this looks complicated, but if you break down the demand equation, We've got our, our just transformed parameters there. With fixed effects, 
and random effects. So the actual syntax is not very difficult to implement. And then finally, just a quick plug for Tidyverse. Imagine that you have a, a, a discounting data set where you have uh, participants that have completed three discounting tasks and you're keeping track, oh, thank you. Uh -huh. So they've completed, so you have a participant, they've completed three discounting tasks and you're interested in, in order effects across all the participants. So if you were to try to analyze this in PRISM, that's a lot of filtering and a lot of cutting and pasting. Right? But if you use Tidyverse, you import your data, you can subset it by individual, progression and the order, you fit your model, and because it's subsetted, it's, it's, it's holding separate all those model fits, and then you can bring it back together, you can have your, your fit diagnostics or your, your fit indices that are applied to each separate regression, and then you unpack it, and it looks like this, where you have individual one who has three discounting tasks, and you have all your information right there. And then say you want to take this, and you want to get, um, you want your group um, summaries, again, you take that data, you can separate it by the discounting task and the order in which participants saw the task, and right there you get all of your mean and median values, and it looks like this. So again, for each order, for each task, you have your summary statistics. And so I was able to accomplish all of that in 20 lines of code. And so once you get this down, this analysis took me 15 minutes to conduct compared to the hours it would have taken me to copy and paste into prison. So just in, in conclusions, we, we want to point out that multi-level modeling is not a silver bullet. Right? It's just it's a powerful tool, it's an additional analysis. We're not saying throw out visual inspection, we're not saying throw out those behavior analytic tools that we have. But we are saying that if you if you want to implement statistics, and, and we would maybe make a case that you, you probably should if we want to improve our communication with the rest of psychology, then multi-level modeling really is one of the best tools, one of the best ways we can do that. And so again, just to kind of summarize. The power of multi-level modeling is that we can leverage subjects' individual data instead of being restricted to just a single mean. So, um, and for those of you who are interested, those of you who are just not sold on any kind of statistical inference, there are um, Bayesian approaches that are available and those are becoming more and more accessible. So now there's a really nice wrapper on your multi-level model that will just do the Bayesian analyses for you, and so you don't have to like specify prior coherence start or anything like that. Like it's, it's, it's becoming more and more simple. So if you, if you want to attempt that, I mean the interpretation is more difficult, but that's a, a really neat tool to think of. So just to wrap up, we just want to acknowledge um, some people who've helped us, um, my colleague Frank Kaplan, um, Amy Oda, both of our advisor, who um, was crazy enough to let us as behavior analysis students take as many statistics classes as we could in order to learn these things. And, and we, we feel like that's a really great approach to take because if you're interested in this, I know this is a lot. And like John said, this is like a entire semester's worth of, of information. So I don't expect you to come out of here and then go do all this in R today. But I promise you there's a statistician in your department who's eager to help or make your grad student learn it. Um, it'll, it'll serve them in the future. Uh, and Based on what Freddie was just saying, I, you know, I have to thank Mike Andrew, who is my direct supervisor, who's an epidemiologist. So pretty much every week I creep in on his door, hey Mike, how do I? And he, oh yeah, and he's really always excited and happy to help me figure this stuff out and apply it to you know our field and solve these problems. And I also want to thank Todd and Bertrand for inviting us to do this talk. Uh, and we wanted to, to make a note um, too that uh, directly following this event, I believe in this room, we're going somewhere I didn't know. Uh, but following this room, there's another panel. Dis uh, there's a panel discussion on the potential of statistical inference and behavior analysis. Uh, a panel of discussion is the official title. Uh, but I encourage you all to stay. I think it, it'll be a great conversation. It's something we should all be participating in. Um, and so we have a few minutes for some questions. Uh, Brady's going to post the slides on on my research research on gate. Research right gate. Uh, Give me a day to do that. In, in a day or two, uh, and. Because Brady asked, we're going to give another shameless plug for this great paper uh, with Frank Hamlin. Thank you very much. Looks like we.
do have some time for questions. Yeah, so I, I mean, it, it, you'll, if you're down to four, your model likely won't converge. And if it does, you can't be very confident that the parameters accurately reflect your data. So that is that is a limitation. And that is something that, that again, we recognize that if you're, if you're just running, you know, if you have your four subjects or participants, um, this is maybe not the thing for you. But at that, at that point, you probably shouldn't be even doing any kind of statistic, right? Um, but what, what, what I do see is when you get up into the 10 to 20 level, you know, I see lots of researchers start to use things like t-tests and ANOVA. And so then at that point, this is a much better approach to take. Because there's no more questions right now, I'd add another quick point that I, I don't always agree with Brady on this too. Because sometimes we have data sets. You know, I, I did a small experiment one time and I was looking at inner response times. And so, from four subjects, I had thousands of data points. And so, in that case, it, it, sometimes it, the you know you might have a random intercept for the different subjects, and you might not be sure that those random intercepts are perfect representations, but you still have thousands of data points from each subject. And then that point. You can sort of be reasonably sure that that might be a good estimate. Yeah, thank you, everyone.